We're on. We're on. <laughs> Elthon? Here. Pritchard? Here. Nystrom? Here. Teban? Here. Melhouse? Here. Uh, first, on the agenda is refuge and visitors. Okay. Next is consideration of the agenda. Uh, any changes to the agenda? No changes to the agenda. Okay. I'll entertain a motion for approval of the Okay, is there a second? Okay. Yeah, moved by Dr. Nash, Secretary of Mr. Elman, to approve the agenda as printed. Any comments? So, uh, is all those in favor? Speak by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passed. Hearing of delegations? Again, I'm hearing you can see anything. Any comments on the computer? Okay. Nothing. Okay. So this is the opportunity for anyone from our community to um, come and, and speak if they have concerns or questions about our pre-grading package. Okay. Are there any questions, concerns? Okay. Uh, 534. Just turn for the I got to wait Three point oh three. Maybe not. Okay. Hang on for the comments. I'm going to adjourn. Fine. Uh, so, yeah, so I think that DLR, Eric Barron with DLR is going to begin, get a whole team that will help 
So do you want to else? Yeah, do you want to yeah. put it over close to him? <laughs> Oop, right there. Right there. Oh. <laughs> there you go. Got my mouse there. Um, thank you for having us again this evening. Um, so last time we were here, um, we talked a little bit about schematic design, and where that one was uh, bringing to you kind of the overall concept. Um, talking about the overall concept of the program, um, there was some budget information discussed, um, and um, oh, here, there you go. Um, and so what's happened in that time period is uh, more project development um, of the overall building concept, as you just saw uh, through the, the public hearing, um, we did that issue and did a pre uh for the building pad itself. So what we're going to go through tonight is uh, a design development still. Um, this is an in-depth still of um, all the different aspects and, and facets of the building. I'm going to turn it over to, to Andrew to talk a little bit about um, you know, just uh, some high level of uh, components of the, uh, of the agenda here, and specifically the design, and then I'll jump back in and we'll talk a little bit more about the other uh, aspects of the, of the project. So, schedule air crash schedule has several user needs, um, mechanical, electrical, technology, um, materials needs to really help kind of refine the scope as we move forward. Jump down to the images here. The exterior images that we presented at the last um, meeting, some of the feedback we heard was just talk about some of the colors on the exterior, so we're going to be updating that. So, pulling that in and moving away to some of this more um, bluish green, uh, blue colors on the exterior of the building. So, that's a great feedback to have, but we're going to make some updates on the uh, exterior elements. And then um, I think one of the bigger things that you're going to see um, as an inclusion for the design development phase is a little more interior power. So we had two presentation where we walked through the space, looked at the floor plan, talked about finishes, talked about colors, and uh, really trying to apply some in the color theory to how the design needs to be supported by the space. Really rich um, learning environment for students. So here, everything from uh, carpet tiles to vinyl tiles to countertop materials. I'm um, really the, the whole spectrum of uh, materials are So, um, taking into account aesthetics, uh, durability, uh, first cause, maintenance cause, all these things. Um, Um, these are three uh, different colored zones within here that help with uh, wayfinding for students and thinking about these learning environments um, as a cohort of students and staff working together um, as they progress through the years through their learning neighborhoods, they're experiencing some different colored tones and values um, throughout. And then always coming back to some of this um, green color here that really ties back in with the district colors, which at the front entry will have um, for sure some. And um, color schemes. Color concepts on um, four finishes. A little bit hard to see here, but I think on the PDFs, you can decide for some of the different uh, color tones being used throughout the uh, wall color um, additional finishes. And then uh, a little bit easier to see here is some of the initial renderings. Um, since our meeting, through the conversation we had, some of these are going to change a little bit. Again, this is design development. We're kind of refining and refining to get to the final product. So um, at the front entry, um, you're going to have a one experience. So you're going to come through a safe and secure entry vestibule, um, be graded here, and have access um, to the One of those few comments we're seeing is um, the ability to incorporate a lot of color in this environment, uh, a lively, bright area. We have a lot of access to daylight where you can see the site, you can see some of the outdoor learning environments, outdoor play areas. 
and then through the left and through the right you actually go into the main. Of standard learning, uh, large group learning environments. To your right, you're seeing the media center um, or the library for access to content and um, there, uh, behind us, there's a steam lab. There's transparency out, a lot of openness and openness for students. Staff and school staff and staff. As we move into the learning environment, so this is one of the discovery spaces that we're finding. Is this the total areas or think tank areas within the middle? Um, yet with Connection of this building to the whole classroom. Flexible seating, um, seeing at different heights will be incorporated to help um, provide some differentiated learning environments throughout. Just bringing in daylight from above to um, help provide a great, uh, rich learning environment that has the benefits of natural light. Look and turn into one of the four classroom areas. Um, Classes, uh, make sure you park surface, soft surface, foreign materials, access to cubbies, base room storage. Uh, you're seeing a, kind of a primary teaching wall and secondary teaching walls, and then access to their. Um, so, uh, this within that learning suite on um, this type of environment is very similar, but classroom to classroom. And then when you look at grade level, grade level, we're incorporating. Um, not only the floor finishes, but also some of the wall finishes as well. That helps change the experience for students so it's not the same um, throughout their, their tenure in the building. Discovery spaces is the pre K one specifically. Um, you're seeing similar types of environments. I mean, small group rooms, the students need some additional testing or need to work on one with a paraprofessional. They have that ability to do that. And then good. And sight lines from the classroom into these areas uh, just to help uh, kind of lines between um, have four class area flexible shared learning environments. I think for a lot of different types of learning activities, um, it really gives the teachers resources at their fingertips that they can use to help um, meet. Uh, one of those discovery areas, um, similar types on similar types of environments, but articulated in a little bit different way. That's some um, kind of a uh, big stuff to work through um, the details, finer details of site plan, site layouts, um, the floor plan for uh, all intents and purposes has changed, has not changed. In there because after we met with um, the user group for the adjacency, the uh, location of all the spaces, the other big development um, as of last week, we had some uh, we talked about these user group meetings. So, being with the mechanical staff, uh, we you kind know, of had an opportunity to, to sit down with your community facilities director, um, also with, uh, looking at a site plan. So last time we talked to you, we had a couple of different opportunities for uh, layouts for, uh, for that. Another thousand pages of all the technicals that we've been working with. My instructor, on. Um, it's great reading if you uh, you know have insomnia. <laughs> uh, but those are all the technical pieces of how to start to, to get your project actually built in the home that's, uh, that's behind it. 
Um, so we've begun that in the design development in the stage. What we're asking for tonight is that you know, we're looking for the board to construction company to take all that information to the next level. Or again, we have to, uh, the more detailed coordination with right, um, the city and making sure that you know what you see here is um, is communicated to the construction document that a contractor can then take and and uh, so. Um, so that's kind of a high level from the design uh, standpoint and what has changed from uh, what you have been doing. Bring you on your way out tonight. Um, we do have physical samples from the part to see on the, on the projector on the screen sometimes colors. Uh, but in the back table here, we have some samples of carpet, some tiles, uh, paint. Uh, I think you see touching from the Any questions about what you've seen or um, positive negatives, uh, you know, things that you said? Uh, I'd like to have a little feedback from Otter. This is like, it's amazing. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's positive of the teacher's feedback. Um, Andrew has been an amazing leader in hearing our staff really, really well. Mariah, our designer, heard everything we asked for. And has done a really, really nice job. Each user group that's met has made some changes and changes. And then, you know, we all want the moon and the stars, but we've also adjusted. There may have been a floor conversation where Mitch said, which one's cheaper? Okay, that's what we're going with. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you know, there's some of those things that we've been able to adjust so far. I also think that it's been huge to have all those stakeholders be a part of those conversations. Our PLC leaders came, our media specialists, our our music teacher, our art teacher, um, our secretaries, and they've still been stewing and adding ideas too. So I really think it's a culmination of a lot of people's hard work. Um, I think one thing that I, you know, I really appreciated was the way that they use some of the greens that we can use with branding when we enter our gym and our entryway. I think branding is used, but be proud of the little tortors. Um, so that's awesome. Red is not the best color for little pumpkins. Metro calming, um, and it really became a neutral in here too, which was really, really nice the way it rolled out. Um, they were super responsive about the carpet. It's a really, um, you can walk over and feel it later. It's like a foamy carpet, but it doesn't stain because we also know little pumpkins. Um, everything from the finishes in the bathroom to how tall sinks and toilets are, um, they've been really responsive on. So I cannot wait for two years to come. <laughs> That um, I want to move into a kind of secondary discussion um, related to kind of cost and overall. Yeah. Um, I like this. So I've got just a little uh, supplemental presentation to go through here. Which one? There's G2 or G. Without the two. Without the two? That one? Mm -hmm. I have. Do you have these slides in our these? No. Where's the play at? Oh, it's cut off on my screen. That's why. Nope, I lied. There it is. So we've been continuing with the pile information um, since uh, since uh, last week. So you do not have this in your finger packet. This is information only at this point. Um, you have the budget information within your within your packet, and this is really just kind of a, a supplemental breakdown uh, to some of those things, just to explain a little bit about the market. Um, so we continue to work with Lang and, and kind of put together some cost evaluations of things, but. Um, if you haven't turned on the news lately, it's, you know, I know it's just kind of depressing to think of sometimes, but um, what you should be paying attention to is, is the construction market and cost. Inflation, um, it is here and, and it's, it's, uh, it's kind of unfold right now. So some cost history um, information that we have over the past 10 years, we analyzed cost of inflation has averaged about 4%. Some years it's higher, some years it's lower, um, but annualized 
kind of figured out that it's about um, it's about four percent. Um, when we budgeted for your project prior to the bond reference, that was in October 2020. We knew that there were some talks of uh, pressures that were happening at that time. Um, that was you know, at the time that COVID was, was really kind of hit a, a foothold. Um, but we didn't have a, a full understanding of what that was going to be on the market. And so, as an adjust, inflation adjusted cost per square foot, um, $235 per square foot was anticipated for the project. That's, that's where we were based on historical uh, values. Portion of the current market, local and national, is, is really just continuously volatile, ever changing. Um, everything from you know, chips and cars to paint to drywall to steel, everything is just in flux. If you can get the product, it's super expensive. If you can't get the product, you know, it may be here. You know, it for a longer period of time. So we're just fighting this constantly within the market during the last uh, six six months or so. And we're continuing to have conversations, clients have conversations every day with different vendors with different suppliers. So I just went out and the associate general contractor sent a nice little piece here that we put together in June, which is still applicable today and probably even worse than what some of the figures and stuff that they have here. Um, illustrating here, you can see on the chart, hadn't cost flat, right, uh, flat project prices. Um, so what they're illustrating with this red bar here is where bid prices were really anticipated. Remember I talked about that 4%. Now this is kind of a national thing, so this is not for the island market, but it's it's just as pertinent for the island market. And this just talks about the, the time period between May 2020 and May 2021. So things have gone even farther beyond what this data is showing here. But you can see the red is where people, where uh, contractors have predicted things would be. And the black line uh, shows uh, the, uh, the differential 24.3% over what things were for thought that had been. Okay. So looking at just some of the individual things that are contributing to that, Really high. Now, lumber has come down a little bit. It's not gone down to the price that it was, but it has come down a little bit. But steel, copper, aluminum, all those things continue to inflate, and the price index for some of those things have jumped 111%. Uh, so that just gives you kind of an overall market for two items within a list of a whole bunch there, um, and it just it goes on down the line. Fuel is kind of pump. All those types of things add up together. So what I did was I went back to projects that we had designed that we had done, um, and given kind of do uh, an estimate here because what I'm trying to do is illustrate um, that this 235 square foot was actually budgeted properly, um, but the market now has kind of taken over and, and really you know figured up a lot of things for for a lot of people across the state. Um, not just uh, at every school district. This is not a boom issue. This is a state of Iowa issue. Um, thank you for moving me a little bit earlier tonight. I'm on my way to another meeting to have this very soon conversation. Um, it's not a good argument. It's not a good It's every contractor, every architect, every owner in the state of Iowa. So, to put things into perspective, you can see over here on the right, boom in high school. So, we need your project here. Um, in 2012. And I want to show you a little bit of history of the other things that were happening at that time period. So Gilbert High School, Gilbert High School, they did in January, North Pole did a um, high school in February, and then um, really in October. And you can see here in 2012, the average price there was all about the same. So then what I did is average 4% inflation estimate over time. Some years is higher, some years is lower. And what I did is I just took the time value of money, escalated all those things. So you can see down here at 2021, this time period scenario, 226, 226, 225. So based on this market analysis, the 235 that we budgeted for you to is actually over that, right? We just did, um, we just did, uh, let's see, oh, sorry, Urban Elementary number one, a new uh, elementary. 
And then just a little time later, uh, you're the Lake um, Elementary School, which is, there's a lot of similarities to, to your project. In 2019, it was $214. So if I go back one period here, 2019, okay, we're starting to see a little bit of inflation. It was projected to be 209, 208, and but room bail was at 214. Still, if you use the time value money and you move forward 2021 to 31, okay, that's 40 year to Storm Lake again, which is the use as a custom for your project in May of 2020. But um, that data $221 a square. Things actually went down if you look at the time value money there, um, it was a conversion square foot. So we set your budget in about October. So we were still within, within the parameters of that solution. Okay. Now we have some interesting data as of about um, a week and a half ago. So Urbandale is um, consolidating on my they are going to four. These buildings are identical, not in shape, but in material, in cost, in work, in, in <laughs> amenities, and all the things, aspects of it. They're identical buildings. You don't get that shit very often. 118,000 square feet. It's a two story building, same geographic location, same products. Remember, Urban Net One did it at 214 square foot. On September 2nd, 2021, that same project did it at 278 dollars square foot. We had multiple bids that day. I won't even tell you what the high number was. Okay. We figured out that in the last two years, the annualized rate was 14% for this area. Now, if you remember, I showed you this at home ago, it's 24% na uh, nationally, uh, just from May 20 and May 21. So, is there a sold line here? We're doing pretty good. <laughs> but it's about 14%. That's not lands, you know, doing that's not the one you're seeing, that's not any curve plan. Um, that's a huge number, that's a huge gap. So, what I wanted to do is just illustrate some of that um, for you um, and to kind of put together an order of magnitude, right? Because where do we go from here? How do you how do you recover? What do you, what do, you do? Um, so again, your original boom um, estimate or your budget was 80,000 square feet. Um, at that 235 was about 18.8 million. Current budget, what we just worked with Lang uh, from the loops on, we've been able to tighten up your building of your program. It doesn't mean that you've lost something, it means that there's efficiencies, right? We estimated that we're going to be at about 8,000. Um, that's the whole process of going to pre design, schematic design, design development, or about 79,000 and a half. On the budget that was put together here just in the last couple of weeks, again, uh, prior to that September 2nd, you know. Uh, Actual bid value is $275 range. Cost of the monitor is only nine dollars So as an order of magnitude, sometimes it's hard to count. Like, well, what does that mean? How do we put that in the first place? So all I did was I put together some building components. I just to give you a, an idea and understand what the budget is doing in the system. We went through some value engineering uh, things. Uh, things that, that Andrew showed you when we get our choices. Um, all of these buildings in Storm Lake and Urbandale and North Pole and Gilbert, and you're going there not to find the hall. They're, you know, just part of things. Color the park, color the walls, ceiling paths and stuff. They may look expensive. That's kind of the point is we're doing our job to get in a very uh, vibrant building and a very well trying to get at a low cost. But just to give you some of those ideas, so one grade level time, I can give a um, one grade level building. We just one of those costs on four point nine million. Generally, those are running in the, they have been running in the forty dollars square foot. For now, the fifty dollars square foot range. Your electrical system will be going. Those numbers are usually running in a 21 to 22 dollar square foot range. They're now up to 30. Uh, magnesium. Uh, you know, up, why is it not bigger than 275? Um, it's a bigger volume. You don't have as much finishing and stuff going on inside. 
so we can discount those things a little bit, but you know, two million dollars. And then parking stalls, you know, so more parking lot was about half a, almost a half a million dollars uh, for the parking lot. So what I'm trying to, to explain and then show you is that um, we're but when they grow up, when they grow at that rate at a 14 percent every year, nobody will count that. that that's a hard thing that will come. And we are, you know, we are looking at materials and finishes. But it's not a finish issue like in this case. So, um, so those are the, the, the things, the, the challenges that, that we as a project team, um, by your dream school. Uh, and I don't, you know, I don't have a silver bullet, I don't have the, uh, but I wanted to call this to your attention and give you where. What's happening in the market? And again, um, you know, don't shoot the messenger <laughs> um, because every district in Ohio is having the same problem today. today you know, um, and things are you know, they're not getting any better as we look down the pipe. Like, um, earlier this year, people were kind of saying, "Just let me get this." I'm not allowed. <laughs> now, when I talk to people, they're like, "Go uh, anywhere." Um, you got awesome bids, awesome bids for your free writing contract, building that in, um, bird work and things like that. There's as much as anybody work, there's not a lot of material costs, um, but think of that. But and uh, and on that, right? Yeah. <laughs> this one. Yeah, the, uh, the overall class uh, increased around 10 percent. So while the roof line still had a decent value, if you went straight as a third story, there might be marginal savings. It's not. It's not like a Y'all are again, and we've gone through it. Our in house estimate team and looked at what can we cut, what can we change. I mean, it's the coolest building. I mean, it looks good. You know, they did a really good job with the materials they have. And it's like you cut it down in steel masonry. Um, dollar amount per square foot is really not going to change farm. Just to, just to give people an idea, what was the value of the 10% reduction on glazing? Because I think that's it's a big amount of glazing for you're not really saving a lot of money. I think people might be interested in. So one of the examples to answer your question pretty directly here is on this roof line here. So if we if we flatten this out, we still have this beam and still have this beam and still have this beam. So what we did is we did a, a detailed analysis um, back to find things um, to say, okay, what is what is that really costing us, right? Because there's, you know, this this glazing is taller than this glazing. This taller is taller than here. So what we did was we figured out what the linear foot uh, of steel, the height differential, the, the glazing differential, and we wound up, I think, reducing the height of that structure by. In order to keep this, in order to keep this line here, that was about a fifty thousand dollars savings. In order to get the same look, 
with a slightly different, slightly lower height. Um, so you still have all those components that, are, that still have to be there. They still have to hold up the roof. They still want to introduce some, some daylight into the space. Um, typical daylight only penetrates a, a room or space about 25 to 30 feet. Okay. So your building is much wider than that. And so when we talk about that middle, that middle area, um, in order to get daylight, you've got to introduce some other inflation pieces that can put some things in the cafeteria. Um, we, we looked at some of those things very, very detailed. And okay, you know, in order to maintain that, how do we do that? When we lower it, and, and you still have the I think that my point is the problem we're going to have is people are going to see that we're over budget, which we are, and they're going to assume it's a complex building and it's finishes. But really, if we took the whole gym away, we'd still be a million dollars over budget because of the market. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of drastic situation we're in. It's not because we took, we have a lot of glass or a little bit of glass. It's, it's because of the unique situation we're in. I, I would like everybody to kind of have the same message that you know we've gone through it. I yes. mean we have we have gone through it with a fine tooth comb. We took off square footage of the office space, we've cut down the offices and classrooms that we don't need. I mean this isn't a splurge, this isn't a there's nothing left that's magical and I mean it's beautiful I and mean, it should be for our students, but there's nothing every thing that we've looked at has been to be fiscally responsible for our constituents as well. And so I think that's the and they cut like I don't know, was it a half million bucks up through the first value in an hearing session? That's a, that's a hard thing to do at 80,000 square feet. I mean, I was really impressed with some of the decisions that were made. Um, it's just where we're at right now. I just report for the board to ask some of these questions, not to move in here for the public to hear, but we've done everything we can to keep this as close to the budget as possible. We could have less aesthetically pleasing materials, but they aren't going to be cheaper. So I think that's the message we're trying to get across is that we've done that work to decrease the costs as much as we can. Um, so just because it's pretty doesn't mean it's expensive because that's usually what people think. It's, it's, they could be less aesthetically pleasing and be just as expensive. And the thing that we're not adding right now is in a normal, in a normal scenario, we make a reproduction. So we talk about we have a million dollar reduction for a hundred. We usually have a year or two years before you inflationary get to that point. Then we're seeing those numbers be quite balanced in a matter of a month. Uh, the project and um, Vendors are calling and say, normally we have to have vendors hold their bids for 60 days. Yes. Of course, any vendors not holding prices for 48 hours. General vendor stories are held in some way. Chips off the coast, and then get in the port, and we have enough further expense to get them in the week. Um, the other thing, maybe you can help me with is I think people are going to want us to, to wait. You know, they'll say you're over budget, maybe costs will come down. But my opinion is the sooner we can bid this job, the more competitive we'll be to contractors wanting to tackle it first thing in the spring because our site's going to be prepped, people's pipelines won't be full. You, is that a is that a true statement? That is totally true. And uh, and the other piece of that is um, <coughs> on cost, but also delivery. So right now we're seeing um, we we did a a uh, and it was six months to get roofing installation. I said if you don't put your name in the in, in the hopper, a year before. So what you're trying to do is clear your spot in line. 
and time equals money, right? So the longer you wait, you're going to be some of those things that you can see in the scheduling of, of procurement of, of, of product. Um, double edged sword right now is yes, oftentimes so let's wait, let's let the market settle out. But you know, if you're, if you're watching the news again and seeing what's going for Congress and the potentials for other infrastructure type bills and things, the market is saturated, oversaturated right now. If you no scheme, right? To what to the things that can happen because you're adding more pressure to the by supply the chain. The other problem for us is any delays we have is going to cost us real dollars. That's Agent Lincoln. Yes. <laughs> I mean, we could easily, if, let's say we waited six months and saved 300000 bucks. We could put that into a roof or something, no problem. Yeah, we're, mm -hmm. we're the I have a question about bids. So if we get bids and we take current numbers, and there's some miracle costs go down. Do you have an agreement in bed that you just think good? So yeah, any any time the numbers fluctuate, if they would fluctuate now, the, the district would be the beneficiary of those of those lower numbers. Um Oh I'm saying you get something for a thousand dollars and then through some wonderful miracle things go down and really the cost is only eight hundred dollars. Do you pay me? No. See, that's what I said. If I got the but on the flip side, if it goes the other way, yes, you were saying. And to reiterate, like DLR has done a wonderful job keeping everything on the schedule. We've got this free grade package out. Uh, the December bid time is, is generally good. Crazy now. So it's a clean site. They can come in in March and start rolling. So that's. That's the positive. The, the way it's like That's playing it positive. Yeah. That your 75 square foot estimated as of today or estimated for in December, you think for the next <laughs> 275? Yeah, that was that. Right now. And actually, and actually in fairness, we, <laughs> it's actually proof of how uh, in the other fire to us have a proof of any factors that we did. Top four grand in the estimate for that. So, uh, 272. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Any other questions for either our architect? Board members, any questions? I believe. We just need a motion to, to yep. approve this page. So we approve the design development phase and proceed with construction documents. <clears throat> okay. Okay. So move by Mr. Richard, second by Mr. Stephen to approve the phase in order to proceed with construction documents phase. Any other questions? Hearing none. <coughs> All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 <coughs> Opposed? So you can see um, on your screen, we have all of the bids that were open last week, and we would as a district would recommend approval of the pre-grading package, um, go to Construct Incorporated at Ames, and you can see the bids that were listed.
Sometimes we have what you go over to a kind of focus. Yeah. And you've worked with construct in the past and That's they're true. reputable. Okay, it's moved by Ms. Steele, seconded by Dr. Nyson to approve the construct bid for the free grading pack. Well, I'm excited to see some work. Very excited to see that happen. I'm saying aye. Opposed? Motion passed. <laughs> so we would just recommend that we set the hearing for the next board meeting on October 11th. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Set the hearing date of October 11th at 6. Okay, and it's a move by Mr. Alvin, seconded by Mr. Pritchard, to set the uh, building. Uh, so. Comments, questions, concerns? Favorite two components by saying hi. Hi, hi. Hi. Yes, so you have the list of individuals that have attained graduate hour, graduate hours, making them eligible for lane changes for the 21-22 school year, and I would recommend approval for those that were listed in the document. Questions, comments, concerns? Is there a motion to approve the lane changes? Okay, moved by Dr. Nyson, second by Ms. Stevens to approve the lane changes as presented. Okay. 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 Next is the Title One service. Yeah, so facts as <clears throat> renewal. This is um, our the private schools uh, have utilized facts ed. This is a continuation of that renewal um, <clears throat> for them to have Title One services in their buildings, and that runs through the public education system. So, um, would recommend. Approval. These are dollars that are already allocated to our private schools. Okay. Questions? Uh, any explanation? Any Hearing none, is there a motion to this activity? Uh, Approve the Title One service renewal for the Fax Ed program for training in Sacred Heart. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it's moved and seconded. Richard to approve the Title One uh, services renewal for Trinity Lutheran and Sacred Heart. Any further discussion? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Financial services agreement, 
Correct. So this is just recommending um, approval for the agreement with Piper Sandler, Sandler for the two bond refunding and the new safe bond issue. So it's just agreement to have them be our financial bond. advisor. Yeah. Second over here. Okay. Okay. It's moved by the Dr. Nyson. Nice. Financial Services Agreement with Piper Sandler. Further questions? Hearing none, I'll open up the next time. Opposed? Motion passes. Next is the dissemination. Yeah, I'm actually going to let Mr. Lewis um, share a little bit more about this. So, this is just an addendum to our current agreement. Um, that Piper Sandler will do our required annual filings for um, the two refundings and the new um, saves, sales tax issue. So, yep, yep, this is one part of it. We'll start in the million hearings here soon. So, okay. Is there a motion over here? Move to approve the dissemination agreement agenda. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Move by Mr. Pritchard, seconded by Mr. Alton to approve the dissemination agreement. Mr. Piper Sandler. Opposed? Motion passed unanimously. So this is back to our elementary school. So this is to allow for uh, Terracon to do testing and special inspections during the pre-grading phase. So I'd obviously recommend approval. And this amount is in the budget already. This is not something that's additional. Or yeah. Okay, questions? Okay, it has been moved. I should second it by Mrs. Stevens to approve Derek on for construction for question discussion. Uh, opposed? Motion passed again. Next is the uh, Vega uh, lease extension. Correct. So, this is an extension agreement for where our homeschool assistance program is. Our lease is officially up on July 31st. And this allows us to stay until we would leave that premises at the cost that's listed in the agreement um, so that we aren't held to that hard date of July 31st. So if we exit in August, we'll be able to do so. We'll simply pay by the month. That per month rate going up for this? It's an agreement that the owners and um, we as the district have come to to have some flexibility in that, that term because it was originally set to just end on the 31st and we would typically just renew for a whole year. And we had asked for that flexibility um, with some of our plans. So they were kind enough to oblige and agree to that extension agreement. Our current lease is three years. So yeah. this doesn't bind us to another three years. Question, yeah, next is the... Yes, mm -hmm. yep. Is there a motion on board to approve this? I move to approve the back of the room, uh, lease extension. Is there a second? Okay, Mr. Pritchard, motion to the open seconded to approve the lease extension for the makeup 
So you'll notice the standing committees that are linked are um, the committees in which we have solidified um, new members where it's appropriate. As you know, we have tried to have a rotation of membership so that we can allow other members of our community to participate in some of these. Um, you'll notice that public relations is not linked because I hope to bring that back next month, but I wanted you to be aware that we still have that, but I would recommend approving those that are linked as our, our standing committees because the individuals listed have agreed to participate. Questions, concerns? What's that? There was one. The materials. Oh, it has one member that is recommended by the committee. Right. So we left that part blank. Right. Usually, board president. Yeah, thank you. Um, I believe um, Jan Weston has in the past. And I, uh, I would recommend that we. Remember, I have to have Friend, the CTA made and the thorough review committee as Frank was having four presidents on the Questions, Hearing no further discussion, all in favor, signify the second aye. Aye. I'm Okay, most fast Now, FFA out of state. Hello, everyone. Uh, I believe you all have this document linked in the agenda. So, for those of you that are unaware, we take eight students selected that apply to go to this conference each year. Um, Jim Fitzgerald runs a really high class program here for our students um, and takes them to the top notch convention at the end of each October. The itinerary is attached. Um, he takes careful effort in planning in as many stops as possible along his way. So the students are exposed to as many different um, experiences, whether it's manufacturing or John Deere um, or Louisville Slugger or the uh, Kentucky Derby. I I was kind of wondering where my invite was. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm here to kind of give a quick run through and then see if there are any questions. The students pay $175 a piece and then the rest is covered by a fundraiser that's um, done each uh, year previously. I greatly enjoyed the conference and the information. It's a really representative platform. Issues that I'm aware of. Absolutely.
Okay. Okay. So moved by the student executive, Mike Pritchard, to approve the other thing I take step as presented. Very right good. All those in favor, please start by saying aye. Aye. Motion passes again. It is the ISA SP overall professional profession for these collateral test based skills. <laughs> Uh, that's all the old people here. Yeah, you got used to the name that came while you were in, uh, you know, they changed it again. So, um, the assessment is now um, all schools and states <coughs> in the spring, and uh, we received our results in August, so right at back to school time, um, and the state comparatives. And so, the right to organize those for you tonight into a chart. Um, the assessment is going for the first time in 2019, and then 2020 um, was pandemic time, so we didn't uh, give that assessment, and we gave it again in 2021. So um, as we present these tonight, I think one thing to remember is um, there, it isn't really time to say, uh, because there's a lot happening in between the 2019 and the 2021, and it is only two data points um, with some funky things happening in between. But um, it is the data that we have and um, the data that we are making decisions with uh, to help guide some of the things that we're doing for improvement in our schools this school year that the principals will talk about um, after I do this over here. So um, just to help you with what you're looking at, the 2019 and 2021 results um, at a grade level for Boone and then at a grade level for the state. So for instance, if you look at third grade um, English language arts, which is a reading and a writing test, um, they, they write and produce. Um, two essays, um, as well as reading, and they get lumped all together into an English language arts score. Um, in 2019, our Boone students in third grade, 9% of those students met the proficient level. Um, in 2021, there are, we can look at that and think curricular wise, what are we doing or what practices do we have in place at third grade that typically support third grade? Then you also can. Um, with the statewide comparison, see are we above or below the state average? And um, what's interesting there is again with 2020 states at some grade levels that um, our students did not take, and maybe our students took a little bit, like you can see here, third graders didn't score as high as they did in 2019. But at the state level, there was a much larger bit, and that's probably anticipated thinking that those students at second graders missed a chunk of the the last quarter of the school year, and then um, that's such a pivotal time in learning to read. And I think that's reflected there in some of those scores, but a little less stiff in our third grade. Um, then the other thing that you can do is you're with you can kind of compare at a grade level um, what's happening with students doing their different kids, and their the kids in 2021 have kind of gone through some pandemic um, chaos. Um, and then you can also take a look at a cohort of students if you look diagonally, but you have to skip a line because we didn't give the assessment in 2020. And so, um, for instance, if you look at the fifth graders, or you look at the, um, I'll, I'll point out on the table there, you look at the seventh graders um, in 2021, 51% of those students met um, the provision. And I kind of bolded those because as a cohort in fifth grade, they were lower. So they made growth as a cohort, even though that grade level had shown um, a lower percent of students meeting the benchmark. Um, so you can kind of see what that looks like. And you can look at statewide cohorts that way too. Again, it's a simple cohort. It's not necessarily we have movements and moved out, but it just kind of gives you a sense of this particular group of kids mostly. Here's how they did, and two years later, how here's how they performed. So we highlighted in yellow any places where our group of students were above the statewide average, and then we also kind of put in bold any cohorts of students that may um, grow from where they were when they took the assessment two years prior. And that I want to point out that the third and fourth grade students, this was the first time they had taken the assessment. Um, because fourth graders would have been second graders. In 2019, and third graders were then first graders. And so, this is really the first set. Um, there's no comparative data to say those particular where we stacked up against the state and where um, our kids, how they scored um, compared to the group of kids at a grade level in the past, compared to themselves if they were in our system. 
Um, so with that in mind, I think I'd like to turn over to the principal. They need kind of prepared a little bit of a, we got these results um, in our building based on uh, what we're seeing and where we want to go. So we're starting about I don't have this data, but my kids definitely <coughs> Data. So I open data as much as everybody else does. So we'll have fast scores for you next month. Um, that will be, you know, a little bit more informative. But I wanted wanted to share some of our goals with you too. We have two goals for our buildings this year. Um, one is we look at high reliability schools. We have one focus on um, acknowledging appropriately and celebrating our staff because we know what an impact our teachers and associates and every adult in our building has. Um, so we have one goal around that, going to 95% um, recognition on our survey by them. And then our second goal is of Asian Indian student for reading proficiency, for universal screener, or in the case of TK, we'll be able to use 26 points. Um, so we're really looking at that sound production um, and some of those. Sure that our core, what every kid is getting, we're using those high yield strategies. Um, our staff is super supportive of it. We see huge gain in our students being able to manipulate sounds and then moving into phonics and with the phoning, all of those things. Um, We have implemented the University Project too, which isn't necessarily literacy, but we know the link from math as well. Um, we had some training at the end of the school year, and then some of our staff met a second time. So, drum roll. When is Last week, so our first graders rocked it. Um, some of our staff is new, and they were done when, and not a single kid was lost. In fact, I asked the first grader, do you know where you're going? He's It's based off of last year's fast data and informative data. And then in October, we'll reshuffle based on our most recent fast data. Um, kindergarten will start with in a few weeks, um, or not even a few weeks, a week. And they're going to start with social emotional to build the routines of what win time looks like. So when we have that fast data for them, we can hit the ground running with our interventions that will support that core that's really, really strong for our students. data we know that we know what our kids know and we're really good at it that can even impact them more than one-on-one -on -one work so they're already reading and talking about informing data um and then we're going to just work to be really responsive with that with our problem solving process or with time and really looking at that data every four to six weeks we state average in all four of the areas that we test. So DLA for reading and math for each or four, sorry, DLA and math for third and fourth grade. Um, and uh, the areas where we did have a slight drop, we uh, didn't drop as much as the state average. And the areas where the state grew, we grew more than that. So like Jill said, when you look at the, the one we focus on the most is that you that third grade, which is frustrating really frustrating to my third grade teachers and they own that a lot. But when you look at the state, they dropped 15 percentage points in um, third grade reading. So um, you never, you never, it's hard to, it's hard to kind of three point drop as a win, but we feel like we're in a good spot for that and moving forward in the future. So um, also when you look at some of the demographic challenges I think that we have with our um, number of students coming So I do really have some celebrations um, with their data. Um, one of the things that we're really looking at, especially to address that that score that has been lower, definitely lower than we'd like to see in third grade ELA. There's three parts of the ELA test. There's a reading, a writing, and then a language usage test. 
you can't, they don't give you give you full scores for your third graders in each of those areas. So you have to spend a lot of time trying to piece out where which area they scored low in. So we believe that it's probably writing that is um, bringing our scores up. The grading team especially has um, really working on increasing the volume of writing that our students are doing so that when it's not as it's a hard thing to ask a third grader because that's not how we write. We write by, by putting together a plan and then they write a rough draft and then they edit with a peer and then they talk to people about it and then they come back and they go home and they talk to somebody else about it and they come back and they edit and then they make the final copy. And this writing is you plan, write, edit, revise, finish all in the span of an hour and a half. So um, when you look at it that way, we're, we have to just teach them how to be a little bit more a little bit faster in that process and um, be able to do that some, some of that work on their own and then the volume of writing that they do is going to have to be a little bit more in a shorter time so anyway so that's one of the things we're working on along with a lot of things that i want to talk about with comprehension toolkit and just project Yeah, one of the things is, as we've been focused on, we've really been putting a lot of work in to work with the AEA, and we've brought in some of the literacy, literacy coaches this year. We've really started to focus on our core instruction. And so um, when we're looking at how we can support literacy across the board at the AEA coming in and working with us on what that literacy looks like within each content area, how we use word work and vocabulary, and not only to increase the learning in that content area, um, but to give the kids the, the kind of the stamina and the um, I have A through G and I'm just like, oh, I don't know, I'm just going to take that on staff versus um, I can educationally make a decision based on it. every class I learn and look at vocabulary, look at the word work, and what the prefix mean, what the suffix mean, and I can work through the question and make an educational decision based on I didn't know it, but when I can work through that, what does that word look like? And so, um, working at that at a core level is something that we've added in this year. Um, we've had some really good lessons as we're working with our uh, our standards reference training. While we're implementing that this year, we've had some pilot groups coming through this year. At the same time, where we're doing that, we're implementing literacy. Um, we're, we have uh, Andy Carpenter coming in, who's been working with us, and Aaron Holm is spending a lot of University project working with math. That's where we were. We lost those last year, so we really didn't have any of that. Um, created those groups the year before, probably 90% of the students that we targeted, we weren't able to get to because of scheduling. And so we've always kind of one of the hard conversations that we had this year with some people is we just all get the specials and you want to do these things. And then sometimes I feel like the, the, the scores pay the price. And so we haven't been able to intervene with students because they were in band orchestra uh, taking the specials. And so we tried to limit that this year to say if the education is the most important piece, the things still play a role in your education. Instead of just having all band or all music that they can rotate between band and um, one of their lab classes for reading. Targeted a group of students that were able to focus on this today. Um, we're working with students on setting goals and how they can get out of those lab classes and what they need to do when they achieve those. Um, all been doing across the board. I think we're year five going into our PLC process and standard reference training. Um, and I think we'll really be able to, we're, we're able to target better and look at where the instruction needs to be. Get to that place where we're starting to have conversations on YSRG and what does that mean to comparatively with grading? So a great example that I used um, Friday as a parent was you have two, two students take the same test, no matter what content area it is, and it's 10 questions on the test. And one teacher does 10 points on the test, and one teacher does 50 points on the test. 
gets a zero out of 10, zero percent on the traditional grading. They got some right, you know, maybe there's five questions on each one. And one teacher, you get two out of five, so you get answer two of the four questions, and you get two. And if you get all four right, you get an extra point for getting all four right. So when you get to the end of that, one student might have got 40 out of 50 right, and they were 80 percent. And then the other student could have taken the same test and got 40 out of 50 right, and got zero percent. So how do you identify the learning as a teacher of what they missed or what the gap is or what that area of need is? So with our, with our standards reference grading, we're able to look at what is the essential skill, what have they missed, um, what is the de deficit that they need to address in, instead of point chasing and look at those things and comparing that. And that's just two teachers, for example. In any given building, now you multiply that times 40 different teachers in the grading takes place. It's so hard to identify 2,000 students. So I'm excited to be able to move forward with that, to be able to target the learning and interventions, the literacy work. Really, uh, I'm really excited for this year and how that's all coming together. And finally, your only year of learning and targeting right that's for last, for sure, and short. So uh, we have two main interventions that we're currently using to respond to this data. Uh, number one is our tier two um, win time intervention. So our teachers um, are only selecting students for skill deficiency during win time. We uh, don't do any focus study halls. Um, it's not a makeup work time. It is only meant um, for teachers to intervene for students that are struggling in the skill or in with within the content. Um, the way we were able to do that is we also um, created our lunch intervention system for students that are missing assessments. Um, part of the, one of the issues I've heard over the years in doing standards is that, well, students don't value all this because it's not graded. And um, we are helping them realize the value of their practice by intervening when they don't turn stuff in and they come up here with their lunch and our teachers do their lunch duties up here and provide support and instruction and scaffolds for those students to finish their assessments because we believe that we have great teachers hired and if students are doing the assignments and assessments um, that our teachers are assigning them, that they'll perform better on any standardized test we're required to take, whether it's the ISAP or the Iowa test basic skills back in the 90s. Yeah, and more help. Right, so I think that goes towards some of those concerns that you know you're not doing whole lot of students but you really don't want to do it work. Okay. Use the example of uh practice. If you're on the football team and you don't do any of your practice for the week, you're not playing in the game, it's the same way we wouldn't be setting you up for success. If we allowed you to compete in our game at the end of the week or our summit assessment without all the practice. Great. Question from board members. I appreciate the presentation from all right. So it's not, it's not officially time. They're supposed to complete it in one setting. So figure how long one setting is for a third grader. Probably not an hour and a half. You know, we, our, instruction, our instructional blocks typically are an hour or less. Okay. I just wondered because the way kids start out and go through their own process, it would not be uniform at all. But that because we knew like two, we had two writing prompts and we had meant to target them to be separate. But then when they got into the test, there was nothing that stopped them from. So, um, you know, go,
Not just for the assessment, but they just have to be able to write um, so that they're prepared to be sent to the grade to write more. And, you know, do you kind of the final five paragraphs? I think that was the middle. So for us, third grade is a uh, to require a well written. Paragraph one, more written paragraph, top sentence, and transition to details, yeah, conclusion, yes. and then fourth grade we transition that into a multi paragraph essay. Okay. Take that one paragraph, transition that into a multi paragraph essay. Now, that's not to say everyone's there, but that's what we're working on. Yeah, yeah. then they're working on that final paragraph <coughs> essay. Building that stamina, increasing the writing, and then Thank you very much, administration. We look forward to hearing more reports next month. Uh, next is a minor student uh, school life. Um, um, sure. I don't know. Mr. Bailey may have some more information, but this is an application um, that was submitted to the high school as a result of a medical concern with regard to the parent, I believe, being able to. Um, provide transportation they aren't able to and they're looking for an exception to the school permit rules and that has to go through the board and so you have the application along with the doctor's note yeah i um, minute here mm -hmm. yeah it's under administrative content Here's here. That's the button. Yes, I've been on board right here. Mm -hmm. I come through. <clears throat> and my concern is if I look at the address, it's within the three blocks of one of our buildings, and then go to the end of our building, get on a bus, come over to high school, and it's probably. One walk. First time we've had this, I think, at the high school that this has been a request, so it's new to all of us. You remember uh, history, I don't know. How old is this student? Was a question. We have a student trying to get a. Right we think a freshman. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Why do they not have? They said they don't have. You guys signed content. in. You guys should be you signed have to be in. Signed in to oh, get yeah. it. That request is that they look, yes, that's the request. Sophomore, okay, there is sophomore. Yeah. Um, they say eight tenths of a mile or what about eight tenths of a mile? Say about 
That's the same one. Have a problem. <laughs> We don't know what it is other than that there's a medical issue. I always feel like we add onto a family's situation that is that I just think more. Basically, all I don't know how far it is. So it's 0.1 less with the fire of this. So it's approximately 10 miles. Is, does the administration want to offer an opinion? <laughs> or is this a point? You, would you prefer this to be strictly a board decision? Uh, so, can you order? You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fine with it staying a board decision, but I think the process of going to the board is a, ne is a necessary enough hurdle to keep it from being something of opening up a can of worms kind of to your concern. I don't think we're setting a negative precedence by allowing a medical exemption through the board. If we have five in a year, which I think would be a ton, um, I think we would be doing our community a great service if we allow people to get. To not have to stress their family out. Uh, if we get some sort of medical note for a doctor. That's the reason why they put that that thing not in Uh, even fall just outside of that we've had so many like that literally like live this person on this side of the street didn't qualify in the other if you happen to live if you're inside of that you know you're kind of out of luck so if there really is truly a need and it's been medically verified then <laughs> That's the reason why that uh, makes sense. And to add on to that, um, this isn't like a food assistance the IODFT who establishes the rules for us and what we follow and approve. My three years of approving those is the first time I ever had a request for medical. Mm -hmm. okay. I would make a motion to uh, accept the request. Okay, moved by Dr. Nystrom and seconded. Sign a statement to approve the student request. Further discussion? You want to do roll call or? Um, <clears throat> Dr. 
Hearing no further discussion, all those in favor, by seven. Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Motion passes four to one. So I'm gonna end this on a good note. Governor Reynolds came to visit with our students today and I'm gonna let um, Mr. Bailey and Mr. Johnson share out some of the positive pieces because the kids, I just need to share that what I observed were our students doing a phenomenal job of explaining what they were doing um, to Governor Reynolds. It was just a regular day to them and she came and got to see what it looks like on a regular day. It was. Um, pretty amazing. So I'm going to go ahead and let them share their thoughts. They were able to see that as well. Um, there are, for anyone who's listening, there are pictures on the website as well, you know, um, so you can see some pictures with our students, with the governor as well. But um, she had very positive things to say, but I'm going to go ahead and let Mr. Johnson and Mr. Bailey share. So um, first, I'm really proud of our staff and students for being incredibly flexible. Um, and uh, responsive. We found out around, I was in a meeting when the governor's office called, and so I found out around two o'clock that she was interested in coming today uh, on Friday. So uh, we had a couple hours before everyone left and then the weekend. So I was really um, proud of staff and students for being prepared to, to house and help and host the governor today. Um, she was caught up in another event. So then I was also proud of our staff and students for being flexible I actually was here for about a half an hour, met with Lindsey Hyman and our EDGE students, um, met with IJ, um, Jim Fitzgerald was at a training in Ankeny, so he was not here, but we took her down to our metalworks area, um, not only because it's an area of pride of ours, but also because it's kind of a cramped space, and so we wanted her to see some of our constraints and, and what we're trying to grow and improve. Um, she's uh, really proud of future ready initiatives in Iowa, and um, I think in most cases, we need to lead the way in them. So it was really great for us to showcase um, what all of you have been doing and putting in place. Uh, and I just kind of got three questions to you a couple months in, so thanks. She was very complimentary to Boone in general and had some ideas that she shared with us as well as to maybe some other avenues to continue to expand. And so we will be following up with the governor's office as well as um, Dr. Levo's office um, on some of those potential avenues to try and continue to expand our programming. So we were very excited to host and, and proud of our students as always, but it was nice to let them see that other people were proud of them and not just us. And well, how, I need to yeah. mention Boom TV too. Because yes. We had two uh, girls following around with cameras and they did an amazing job and got in two great questions before <laughs> Uh, students dismissed and um, and then it had a left and it was a great opportunity for those um, really well. I think I was going to add on to too is like the evidence of our students getting those soft skills from like Edge and IJAC and being able to advocate for themselves, clearly communicate what they're doing, what their purposes and Edge and IJAC. That was very evident today when they got her to speak to them and they were able to communicate their purpose and all these different uh, opportunities they get uh, through these programs. So those Moon TV kids at the end, like, saying, okay, I got to go. But actually, we do an interview. Uh, <laughs> it's like a real report. One more. Yeah. 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 So, <laughs> they totally did. Awesome see that in their, in their confidence. So. And they did do a phenomenal job. And I also said to um, John, I think what, you were standing next to me, when the bell rang, Students are used to seeing cameras in our building because they were not phased at all by the fact that there was a camera and the governor talking. <laughs> and so I think that's also a testament that Boone has had the opportunity to kind of showcase what we have going on here. And so that was pretty, pretty impressive. So we're very happy with the visit that we had and we hope to continue to have more opportunities like that. <laughs> I'd like to thank everyone for coming tonight. Uh, we've got a couple closed sessions, so everyone else gets to go home early. We started early tonight. <coughs> the rest of the folks are going to get to go home soon.
Vamos ter que 